Hi, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. My name is Story Powell, and I'm with the Utah Assistive Technology Program, and I'll be your moderator. This training is technology for varying types of hearing loss, and the training is made possible by the UATP. You can learn more about our program and services online at www.uatpat.org. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, today, if you would like a certificate of attendance for the webinar, you can let me know through the chat function, which is located on the bottom of the AggieCast page titled Ask a Question. You can log in using your real name. No password is required. And once your request has been acknowledged by myself, you can email me your mailing address so I can send the certificate to you. I'd also like to note that the webinar today will be live captioned. You can locate that link also at the bottom of the AggieCast page. It will take you to another page uh, will, which will show the presentation on top and the live captioning on the bottom. And I'd also ask you uh, to please take the evaluation at the end of the webinar and that link is on the bottom of the AggieCast page as well titled UATP Survey. And today if you'd like to ask the presenter a question as we go along you can use the Ask a Question button on the AggieCast page. I will then relay that question to our presenter. I'd ask you to not use this area to ask myself or others about technical difficulties. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, uh, you can uh, contact the Utah State University IT, and that phone number is on the bottom of the AggieCast page. And now I will introduce our presenter and training topic. Today, we'll have a presentation by Mitch Moyers of the Utah Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Mitch is an Outreach and Assistive Technology Program Director. He was born deaf and grew up in Northern California. Mitch attended Brigham Young University and is fluent in American Sign Language. Today, we are living in a time of great technological advancements. With these advancements, individuals with hearing loss have much to gain when it comes to communication and connecting with their peers. Those without hearing loss have no justification not to try. In this presentation, we will share the types of technology available for different levels of hearing loss and how everyday devices can be used to help hearing individuals to communicate with hearing aid and sign language users. The webinar will cover demographics, different types of listening devices, alert devices, communication technology for deaf and hard of hearing, and communication strategies. And we will now turn the time over to Mitch. Thank you, Story. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I am very excited to share the, the different technology we have available as well as the information about people who are deaf and hard of hearing and different strategies that we could help to establish a good communication between individuals, whether they can hear or they cannot hear. Before we go ahead and dive in, I want to talk about what the population demographics are is here in the state of Utah. Um, this, the census that we see here in Utah, we have about 294,000, almost 300,000 people with some form of hearing loss. This number is based off a approximation of the national census. There is no real number that says uh, we have so many people with certain types of hearing loss and how, what degree they have. So what happened is they come up with a percentage um, that gave us this number here. Um, most of the time, then when the census goes around, they don't ask you, do you have a hearing loss? And even if they did, most people wouldn't admit, would they? <laughs> um, so here we added the 300,000 people approximately. Almost half, maybe about 48%, are seniors 55 and older, uh, mostly due to just the kind of aging process or exposure to noise or medication during their lifetime. And then we also have the other um, uh, other end of the spectrum, with profound hearing loss, people who are either profoundly deaf or culturally deaf, and we lump them together, and that's almost 4,000 people. And so this range of hearing loss can vary, whether from very mild to almost indetectable type of loss, to profoundly where there's no sound being heard at all. So our goal for our presentation today is to try to create a good 
understanding of uh, customer satisfaction and communicate in a different way than we would normally would with one-on-one. -on -one. And also, we want to ensure an importance of a, complete, a clear and complete understanding of what's being known and expected when it comes to communication. And to give you an example, um, say you're going into a meeting, or some, a familiar meeting, where you walk in, you know the people, and you know the presenter, and the presenter starts to speak, you, you hear, uh, and then you, you receive the information, and you share your thoughts and your feelings, and they're going back and forth. There's no um, anxiousness, whether it, other than what you may or may not know, but there's no anxiousness in when it comes to communication. But in another setting where there's two individuals meeting for the first time, may not know each other, but there may be an expectation that, oh, when I speak, this person's gonna understand what I say and respond to me in a different way. But when that doesn't happen, I call it, it what happened was I call it kind of a communication shock, where suddenly the person realizes, uh-oh, I'm gonna have to do something differently. And a lot of time, we may feel caught off guard and we don't know, our brain kind of short circuited on us and then we start to think of what we, what we do know based on experience or what we may have heard. So hopefully today what we talk about will give you that tools to when you come across a communication shock that you can share those different types of techniques with the person who had the hearing loss or maybe yourself as well. So let's talk about these different types of individuals. And I list it here as deaf versus hard of hearing. Really, if you think about it, the two of them are the same thing. Um, a person with a hearing loss is technically deaf, but we kind of here in society go hard of hearing. And so let's kind of go with that, that general term with hard of hearing. And I'm gonna add deaf in here because it's a small letter deaf, um, not the culturally deaf as I mentioned earlier in the demographics. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But a person who is hard of hearing may have some degree of hearing loss, and as I mentioned before, mild to severe. Most likely they're raised outside of deaf culture. They may have lost hearing later in their lifetime. They may be wearing cochlear implants or hearing aids or may consider themselves part of an oral, oral culture, meaning there's no use of sign language or manual forms of communication. Um, a lot of time they may have speech that's unclear or distorted and we'll talk about why that happened in a little bit. And there's also these individuals are part of um, a group that has Meniere's or an Usher's syndrome, and this affects more than just their hearing. It may affect their vision and balance and other types of health issues. And then we have individuals who may experience trauma or have exposure to extreme noises. Um, war veterans, for example, would be into that category. Um, people who work in large warehouses or heavy machinery uh, with a continual exposure to loud noise that may damage their hearing, or even iPod wearers, uh, people who love to listen to music on a loud volume may experience hearing loss. And then we also have just the good old aging of, you know, period of time. Now we're talking about people who are culturally deaf. Um, these are individuals who usually have a severe to profound hearing loss. And again, it's important to remember that what these generalizations that I'm making here are just generalizations. There's nothing black and white that when a person has a certain type of hearing loss, they fall into this exact category. Otherwise, uh, these are all pretty much kind of a general over eye, overall idea of what type of background they may have. Um, most likely the people who are culturally deaf may be raised in a deaf culture, um, meaning they have family who are deaf and use American Sign Language and have their own language or performances or culture and stories that they share like you would in the Spanish uh, culture or in another country where they get together and have their own type of entertainment based on the language. Uh, people who are culturally deaf, where hearing mannerism, they, I, what I mean by that is a lot of times when a person who is deaf, they're talking with someone who can hear, and all of a sudden the hearing person looks away and starts responding to something else or had body, physical reaction to something they heard. And if you think about it, we live in a very noisy environment, and so 
a lot of time people who can hear will react to those things. So I call them hearing mannerisms because a person who is deaf does not have hearing mannerisms. They don't respond to sound in the same way a person who can hear would. And so a lot of the little idiosyncrasies that people hearing have, uh, deaf people won't pick up on. Um, many of them are more dependent on ASL than English. Many of them don't just consider themselves disabled. And many may isolate themselves from the hearing world, as we call it, uh, just mostly out of a comfort zone or lack of understanding, or they're more comfortable with their own culture or friends and family who signed or are part of that culture. Because it also has its own self sustaining social life separate from hearing society. And um, you'll, if you were find yourself involved in a deaf community, you would see a lot of those different um, standard between the two different cultures. But overall, whether they are hard of hearing or culturally deaf, the strategies of trying to communicate are basically the same thing. So before I get into the strategies, I wanna talk a little bit about residual hearing. And this is important because rather the person considers themselves hard of hearing or deaf, residual hearing varies from person to person. Um, this residual hearing may also change their ability to understand certain sounds or um, how they rely on what they hear, whether they're using hearing aids or whatever uh, type of hearing they have. And also the perception of a person with residual hearing is probably the most misunderstood or most misinterpreted trait of any person of their, of their hearing loss. For example, whether a person uses voice or not use voice, uh, whether the person listens to music or understands speech better, or person how they, how they respond to sound they hear. One good example I like to share is they, about a boxer, um, a fighter that I saw recently in a news report, and the boxer himself was, was profoundly deaf, and however, he, he uses American Sign Language for communication, and he was talking about his life, you know, through an interpreter and sharing everything that he, you know, his experience and what he knew. And then during this interview, and they're showing this video montage, and during this particular session when he was warming up for a fight, he would listen to this music, and he had these headphones on, and he said how the music pumped him up to get him ready for the fight. Well, a lot of people reacted to that and said, how can this person be deaf? He's listening to music, he had headphones on, he's not deaf. And that's a good example of how a residual hearing may be different. A person with a residual hearing may not be able to understand a certain speech, but he can hear the, the deep tones or melody when it comes to missing the music on headphones. Um, and that's good to know because when it comes to <coughs> using technology, certain type of technology may help one individual, but it may not help another one. So for example, if I'm using hearing aids and I hear pretty well, I can use the telephone maybe, or I can talk face to face with somebody without really looking at them. But if I meet somebody else with almost a similar type of hearing loss that I have, and they put the same exact type of technology onto them, they most likely won't be able to have that ability as I would. <coughs> So cochlear implants and people who wear hearing aids. One thing it, it's important to know that they, they, they don't fix hearing loss. It's not like glasses where you can just put them on and all of a sudden you can see. Um, I know that's kind of a general term to make, but that's the best thing I can do to apply here. Um, hearing aids do amplify all sounds and all speech and background noises. Everything from the rustling of papers to the, the gurgling of stomachs when when hungry, somebody's hungry or chewing gum or noises outside and heaters and fans. All the little things that you may hear but don't really pay attention to, hearing aids pick up all of that, including the person, whoever is speaking. So they're constantly competing with the speech with all these other noises. Another thing to know that a person with hearing aids may not always have them turned on. Um, I know that from time to time, I do wear hearing aids myself, from time to time I like to turn them off just to give myself a break uh, from all those loud noises that are going on around me. Hearing aids are also the cause of unknown beeps or squealing that you may hear. 
Um, and also, they, a lot of people who wear hearing aid may have body-worn speech processors or controllers. Like myself, for example, I have a Bluetooth streamer that works with my hearing aids, and then um, I can use it to attach to my phone, either to make a phone call or listen to music. And this is important to know, especially for emergency personnel or police officers, for example, that a person with a, these type of devices may often reach for them. It can be on their belt or in their pocket, and sometimes that little motion may cause a little unease on the person on the other end. So, so I'm going a little bit more about residual hearing. I kind of put an audiogram here, a little chart that you would, you would see, and you can see I don't understand exactly how it works, but I've kind of put down layman terms on the right-hand side there in yellow, where a certain range across the top with somebody who can hear in that, air, in that range is considered normal hearing. A person who falls into the range below the dotted line may have a little bit of a mild hearing loss. And most often, um, a person with mild hearing loss don't realize that they have a mild loss, or the person who is speaking with them may not re realize it as well. When we get down into the moderate, um, this is where we start to notice the difference in the person's ability to hear or maybe even to speak. And then we get into severe, where they're heavily impacted and then profound. Uh, technology can be successful in usually the mild to severe range. Uh, when you get down into profound, you're going to find a lot more difficulties in a person's ability to understand and respond accordingly. I'll give you an example of why here. On the chart, if you see on the left-hand side on the left corner, uh, everything that falls in that range is kind of a low-pitched noise. Everything on the right-hand side is kind of the high pit range. And on the, the, very, the upper level is soft sounds, and the lower level is loud sound, the loudness of that particular sound. And as you can see in the letters there, um, J, M, B, D, B, and so forth, that kind of falls into when a person has a hearing loss in that range, um, they may not hear those certain letters. Um, and if you'll notice on the right-hand side, the high pitch, the F, S, T, H, um, a person, and high frequency hearing loss is very common in, in most people. In fact, when they're both first diagnosed with a hearing loss, this is usually where most of the hearing loss begins. If you look at the chart in the blue lines at the bottom, where it drops down and comes up and down behind the dog and the crab and the phone, I put that in there because this is actually a, an accurate representation of my type of hearing loss. Where the line goes is where my hearing drops. And so, basically, without my hearing aids, I cannot hear waterfalls, leaves rustling, people talking, or all those letters that you hear in speech. I may or may not hear a telephone ring. I may or may not hear an airplane flying, uh, depending on how close I am to the sound and how loud it is. So when I put my hearing aids on, it's going to push me up into the, where all those pictures are and increase my ability. But have you noticed the, the shape of the line, it stays the same. It doesn't push it all into a nice straight line across the top. It still keeps that type of graphic um, up and down. So if you can see the under 3K where it drops, where it peaks up in that spot, I may hear the PH or GAK, CHS sounds. I may hear that pretty well. But the F, S, and TH noises, the S, those type of noises would be very hard to pick up even with hearing aids. Um, vowels are often more, uh, much easier to hear than consonants, uh, or, or sometimes the other way around. Um, another chart line under there you may see in the red, and my sweet wife is, is let me use that chart because that's actually her type of hearing loss. She's con she had what is called a profound hearing loss. So basically, if she's lucky, and I don't know if that's a lucky thing, but she may or may not hear the lawnmower. So, a little bit more. Who are the people with these types of hearing loss? And I'm just going to go very briefly over this, uh, just to give you an example of what type of communication strategies they may have. American Sign Language users, mostly known to people who are culturally deaf. 
bilingual users of American Sign Language and English, and um, I fall, myself fall into that category. I use both American Sign Language and English, uh, which is kind of obvious because I'm speaking to you right now in, in English, I hope. <laughs> Um, we have oralist and hard of hearing individuals also into this category. And this is kind of uh, good to know because somebody who may consider themselves oral generally focus their communication on the, the mouth or the speech or the sound of using technology and so forth. Deaf individuals, usually these are individuals at one time in their life could hear. Um, normally as you can call it, want to call it, and maybe due to a trauma or medical mishap or over a period of time, age, their hearing deteriorated. Sometimes it'll be gradual, sometimes it'll be very sudden and drastic. Elderly individuals, uh, just basically, they call them late deafened, just over the period of time, their hearing loss decreases, it may be based on genetics, or again, trauma, age, noise-induced um, loss, and so forth. We also have individuals who know neither ASL or written English. Um, these are individuals who may be new to America, or don't speak English, or speak another language, or may come from a, a home where they rely heavily on their own home signs or gestures, or even miming. Um, and then there's deaf blind individuals, kind of self, kind of speaks for itself. A person cannot see or hear. Uh, they use braille or tactile signing, and that's where they use it, put their hand between their finger and the thumb, and based on location, hand shape, and movement, they can understand what is being signed based on that. And then the, when they sign, the person who is sighted can pick up that, that pick up the language and respond accordingly. And then the last one, I kind of lumped in there because they always accidentally get thrown in there, and these are persons with speech disabilities. Um, and to give you an example of this, I worked at a Department of Workforce Services for a short period, and uh, on one occasion, the secretary from the front desk came up to me suddenly and said, oh, Mitch, can you come up and help me in interpret for this individual? And I kind of said, well, I'll try my best. I do have a hearing loss myself. I don't know if I'll hear everything they say, but uh, I'll see what I can do. So I walked up to this individual, and he looked at me, and I started to sign to him, and he shook his head. And I signed to him again. He still shook his head. And all of a sudden, he wrote down on a piece of paper and showed it to me. And it said, I just visited the dentist. I don't know sign language, I, but I can hear. And so uh, I told the secretary, he can hear. <laughs> and so basically, she told me, say, well, can you tell him? And, but I had to tell him again, he can, he can hear. So, so anyway, even though they may not speak clearly, they can, be, they can hear. But lot, oftentimes, they get misunderstood that they may be deaf. I want to talk a little bit about lip reading. The most important thing to know that it's not a dependable form of communication, uh, meaning if a person relies 100% on leading, reading lips for communication, um, most often their rate of success is very low. The most effective users, people who read very well, um, can probably catch about 20 or, percent, 20 or 25 percent of the words being said. So in, out, of a word, out of a sentence of about 10 words, maybe two or three, or mostly key words, could be understood, uh, especially if, but a lot of times lip reading can be helped, especially if the communication is within context of what is going on around them or what the communication may be about. Give you an example, the word baby or pay me looks exactly the same. All of you, all of you, I love you, all look very similar. Numbers like 15 and 50 or 60 or 16, uh, those numbers look very similar as well. And so um, the best thing to do with lip reading is use it as a, an additional uh, type technique for communication, especially if the person uses technology uh, like hearing aid, for example. I do, I would watch somebody who is speaking to me. Of course, I'm reading their lips, but I'm also listening to them at the same time. So if I don't hear everything they say, maybe I'll catch what's missing and vice versa. Or sometimes lip reading can help reinforce what I heard. Oh, did you say you wanted olive juice or did you say you loved me? So based on what I see, I may understand them. 
So I'll let's quickly go through some communication strategies. First and foremost, maintain eye contact. Eye contact is basically the so-called windows to the soul, as I call it. Uh, a lot of time when the person, two individuals are speaking, there's a lot of inflection or tone of voice based on their emotion, how they sound. And so a lot of times you can tell whether a person being sarcastic or excited or serious or angry and so forth um, just by listening to the inflection and the sound of the, of the speech. For a person who is deaf or hard of hearing, all of that is pretty much unavailable to them, except when they're looking into the eye, you can almost see exactly the same thing. Um, so when you break that eye contact, you're breaking away the, the additional inflection of the speech. Also, eye contact helps them to be aware that you are communicating with them directly, or if you break away, you look at something, all of a sudden that indicates to the person with hearing loss that what you're looking at is more important than what you're talking about at that moment. And so when you do break eye contact, it's very helpful to make sure that you let the person know what the hearing loss say, oh, I'm sorry, so-and-so over there is calling my name and wants my attention, let me see what they want to say, and so forth. Or if there's an emergency, so, oh, there's a fire behind you, let's get out of here. Um, number two, using paper and pen and pencil for clarification. You can use it as a sole method of communication, but if you ever tried it yourself, it does become um, tiresome and sometimes frustrating because you're spending a lot of time writing, then you are actually conveying communication back and forth. So if you want to try to communicate back and forth, use pen and paper more for a clarification. Like say there's a word that one individual is not picking up or a concept that's not quite clear, then use the pen and paper to make that clear to them and vice versa. Um, number three, try to admit when you don't understand. So if a person is speaking to you, and a person with a hearing loss particularly, speaking to you and maybe their speech is not as clear as you expected it to be, um, or vice versa, if they're talking with them and they seem to be reacting differently than the kind of reaction you expected, then admit, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you understood me or I'm not sure if I understood you. And I'll be the first to admit that I'm the world's best bluffer when it comes to trying to understand people. Um, and, it, and a lot of time, bluffing depends on the situation. For example, if I'm gonna go into the IRS and talk about my tax bill, I'm not gonna bluff. I'm gonna be serious and try to make sure I understand everything they're saying. But if I'm walking down the street and someone makes a remark about the, about the weather and I didn't understand them, I'll probably just nod and smile and so on and so forth and go on because it's just a friendly passerby, but it's not essential to my need and vice versa. Um, a favorite story in, in my family, I have a brother who is deaf, and I, when I was younger, we were going to a photo shop where a you know, certain young lady there worked, and he kind of had a crush on her. Well, while he was talking with her, she had mentioned that her uncle, pa uncle passed away. And I could tell my brother didn't understand because he kind of smiled and laughed at all, oh, that's cool. And that was kind of an embarrassing situation. So this is a good example why you want to admit when you don't understand. Try to use appropriate ways of getting attention. Uh, for example, flashing lights, tapping at the table, uh, waving. If you have to tap them on the shoulder, make sure you have a good clear range, uh, especially because if their focus are heavily on something, and for yourself, for example, if you're focused heavily on a, a, a task or an assignment and someone comes in and starts speaking to you or taps you, you would jump, you would be react, react to that. And that's very, very common for people with hearing loss. Uh, they would have the same reaction if you're tapping them. Try not to cover your face. Uh, visual input is very important. Covering your face, you take away their ability to use lip reading as an additional tool. You also may add a kind of a barrier unintentionally. Um, you may also want to allow them to see what you're seeing. Uh, again, the same idea, maintaining contact, being able to see their face is very important. Don't shout or whisper in the ear. It doesn't work, especially if they have hearing aids. If you want to know what it's like, go to a microphone and just whisper into it or blow or shout into it. 
what you hear coming over the speakers is almost exact, exactly the same unclear, loud noise that you may hear inside a hearing aid. And number seven, don't allow others to interrupt if possible. I know that's not possible in all situations, but again, when it comes to, you know, you're talking with someone face to face and all of a sudden you look away and you start talking with someone to the left and you don't go back for a few minutes, the person's gonna feel like, oh, um, I guess I'm not important anymore, this conversation has just ended. But really what's happened is someone is telling you about an emergency that's happening and giving you some vital information that they need to know. And so um, if you do have to break it, let them know, oh, emergency, I need to catch this and I'll tell you what's going on right away or and tell them to join the conversation at the same time. A few uh, customer service strategies, um, particularly if you work in a, a setting where you're providing a service to somebody, a person comes in with a hearing loss, ask the person right away if, how they prefer to communicate and whether accommodations are needed for them to be able to communicate. Arrange for an interpreter if necessary. So if they request an interpreter, it's usually a good idea to have one in sight, on site. And of course, I know every situation is different, every scenario is different. Um, so based on what that scenario is, you can talk with them, negotiate um, the reason for the interpreter and so forth. Um, if it's just uh, come in and buy a pack of gum, you don't need an interpreter for that. If they demand an interpreter, I'm sure you can negotiate um, this. I don't think the interpreter is a good idea. Or if the person coming in to see a doctor, or something, particularly if it's related to their health, an interpreter is very a good idea to have, especially if they request one. And of course, speak directly to the customer. It goes back to the eye contact and visual input that, that creates a connection between two individuals is important when communicating. Then of course, give information before any action. Uh, examples, doctors, dentists. Um, a lot of times dentists have the face mask, so if you have to tell them that you're going to put them backwards or you're gonna dig around in this tooth and so forth, let them know beforehand with the mask off or through the interpreter, then start the work afterwards. If you start work, say it, and then start working before they get the information, it's gonna create more of a tense um, and uneasy situation. Try to ask questions if they don't understand or if you don't understand. Um, sometimes repeating or asking them to repeat uh, usually help to make sure that the, the information that is needed it got across back and forth. Then when uh, using interpreters, uh, try to avoid using family or friend even if they are certified, um, but particularly in um, medical or high tent situations. Having a family there, they may, based on the person's emotion, how they're connected to that individual, they may or may not share all the information. Um, you want the person to get all the information. So having an interpreter who is certified and outside of the family is, is much more ideal. Um, sit across or stand across from the person with the interpreter beside you. Uh, let the individual see both of you at the same time so they can pick up the information and as well as see your facial expression and emotions. Uh, avoid using he or she words or using tell him or tell her. Uh, you are talking to the individual, the interpreter is just there to relay the information back and forth. Uh, they should be basically invisible uh, if you were talking to them as if they weren't there. Then of course, if you have in very long interviews or long sessions of talking back and forth, um, it's good to have little breaks in between because interpreters do get tired and as well as yourselves. And one thing to know, I want to add on to here, today is uh, you know, the, the first Wednesday of every month is Interpreter, interpreter Appreciation Day. So if you interp uh, use interpreters in your location, be sure to tell them how much you appreciate them. I was told this before I came out here, so I wanted to convey that information. <clears throat> when it comes to requesting an interpreter, if you're not sure what to do, go ahead and contact HR or your administration office, or if you're here in the state of Utah, contact uh, Utah Interpreter Program. They may assist you in where you can get more information about using interpreters. 
uh, try to maintain a current list of qualified services or interpreters in your offices, particularly if you have a contract with an agency or an agreement with one. Have an updated list there ready, uh, so if an uh, emergency or a situation arises, you can refer to that list right away. Um, <clears throat> a certified court reporter is also qualified for real-time captioning. Um, real, I didn't talk about real-time captioning earlier, but basically real-time captioning is a person who sits off to the side with a small shorthand typewriter and uh, types out everything that's being spoken into the room and everything that's being said can be read across the screen on a laptop or a computer. Uh, these are usually more uh, useful for people who don't know American Sign Language or sign language of any kind. Um, <clears throat> so if you want more information on interpreters here in the state of Utah, this is the website, utahinterpreterprogram.org. I think, oh, actually, I think that's the outdated. I forgot to update it. Hopefully, uh, we'll get that information. I think it's ASLTERPSUtah.org. I apologize. I should have updated that before I came up. If, if it's wrong, email me my contact information at the end of this slide, and I'll give you the correct information afterwards. If it's right, then go ahead with that. <laughs> Oftentimes when I go into a site, the, very number, the number one question that I get from most people is, do I have to hire an interpreter? Um, two things to know. One, if you receive any types of federal funds, then the answer is yes. Um, it's always gonna come back to bite you if you do uh, receive some type of funds. The second one is, you can try to talk your way out of it, but most often it's very hard to prove that it's undue hardship. And plus, it's just good business practice to provide an interpreter and accessible services to everyone, whether they do have a hearing loss or not. To give you an example, I put on the link here, if the cost of interpreters versus the cost of a, a settlement, interpreter may range from $40 to an hour or end up paying $400,000 settlement. And I put a website on here, this is an actual story out, in, out of New Jersey where an elderly lady, or an older lady who, um, who was deaf and uses American Sign Language was going to a doctor for regular care over a period of time. And every single time she went, she would request an interpreter, and the doctor would refuse. But she, because of her medical, her medical needs, she couldn't reschedule a fight it, so she kept going back and forth. Well, eventually she got a lawyer, and it came back, and it settled, came out to a, uh, a lawsuit, and then she won $400,000 $400, settlement because the, the doctor basically would have been cheaper for him just to hire an interpreter at $40 an hour than to have a lawsuit at $400,000. Okay, now we're gonna jump into my most exciting topic, uh, at least for me, uh, talking about assistive technology. <clears throat> Here's a picture here of the old hearing aids. <laughs> Actually, they're not, it's just a, it's a picture of during, I believe, World War II when they were, they were experimenting with different ways of trying to pick up um, speech from the enemy lines or sounds that were occurring from a long distance. So this is one example of what they used to try to pick up those type of sounds. <clears throat> so I just thought that would be a good picture to introduce this topic. A brief description of assistive technology. Um, Again, technology is a huge part of a person who is deaf or hard of hearing in their lifetime. Um, today's advancement pretty much have changed lives in many different ways, and especially when it comes to creating communication between in, uh, two individuals or organizations. You know, you've heard the, you know, the common saying when someone asks you a question and you say, the Pope Catholic or does the bear do whatever in the words. And for in this case, did the, the, the deaf person use technology? It's almost the exact same thing. I would, I would be bold to say that if you came across a person with a hearing loss, they're gonna have some type of piece of technology in their life just because it's so helpful in many different ways. Just a brief description of the different types of devices or systems. We have ALS, ALD, and HAT, a bunch of acronym, acronyms I'm throwing at you here. Um, ALS is assistive listening systems. 
These are a system as a whole where you have a large setting with many, maybe one or more, multiple people with hearing loss benefit from the technology. ALD are individual devices or they can be multiple as well um, with mostly for one-on-one -on -one type of communication. And then we have hearing assisted technology. This is more for seeing what type of noise is happening in the environment. So ba basically, assistive technology can refer to anything that informs an individual with a hearing loss when audio is present, whether it's speech or noise, any type of noise. A brief list of different types of devices. We have ALDs, assisted listening devices, as I mentioned before, and uh, a good example of that is pocket talkers. These are usually one-on-one, -on -one, used for one-on-one -on -one type of communication. I always jokingly call them as marriage savers, particularly with married couples in cars when they're driving. Often that's the most frustrating time to communicate because not only is the person with the hearing loss competing with the outside noise of traffic and so forth, but they're also trying to hear what the, he, his or her spouse is trying to say. And I know from my own experience, what I've seen when two individuals don't understand each other and then the communication is important, arguments usually erupt. So pocket talkers in this case, where a person would have a microphone on their chest or in the hold in their hand, and a person would have a, either a headphone or a device that connects to their hearing aids. So whatever is being spoken into the microphone can be picked up by the person who's using the technology. And it's, it's a fantastic piece of technology. Um, and I like often get asked the question of how much these are. The prices range, and depending on what type of technology you want, um, they can range from about $60 to four or $500. Uh, depends on the, all the bells and whistles or the type of quality that you're looking for. We also have doorbell and knock signalers, shake or flash alarm clocks. Um, this is either visual or tactile. They can feel or see noises. Um, hearing signal dogs, dogs that are helpful in alerting the person with the hearing loss of a noise event and taking them to that thing, that noise event, whether it's a baby crying, a, a washing machine alarm going off, a phone ringing, doorbell, and so forth. We also have telephone ring signalers. Um, these are devices that could be uh, uh, manipulated to have a higher pitch ring or a lower pitch ring based on the person type of hearing loss. Um, myself, for example, have a harder time hearing high pitch noises, so I may want a ringer, that ringer that's lower, uh, deeper pitched. We also have amplified telephones, and again, not only does it increase volume, but you can also adjust the tone. Um, you can make a woman sound like a man or a man sound like a woman, whichever is easier for you to understand based on the person's type of hearing loss. There's also video phones, and that kind of speaks for itself, where you have videos on both ends, the person can see each other, um, and you can have audio present, and the person can either use sign, American Sign Language to communicate back and forth, or use lip reading, or just have the visual cues along with the, the audio to communicate. We also have uh, text display phones, or caption phones as we call them, where a person using the telephone can read what's being spoken by the person on the other end, end of the line. And then we also have super loud ringers, um, or flash alarms as I mentioned. These super loud ringers, I'm, they just like the word said, they are very, very loud. Um, I've, I've had individuals who talked about their neighbor being, knowing when their telephone rings because it's still loud. So. Hey Mitch. Yes. Where can uh, people find these devices? Very good question. Um, here in the state of Utah, there's, there's many different stores. There's the UID bookstore, there's the um, Utah First Assistive Technology. Um, if you were to, if particularly if you want a particular a device that you're looking for, whether it's telephone or audio, if you were to do a Google search, um, Utah store for this device, like uh, amplified phones, it would give you a list of all the different, different stores here in the state of Utah. Uh, large sites like Amazon is another good resource. Um, 
I'm trying to get, think of more of it, kind of off the top of my head, but again, using a, a web browser search engine can show you a lot of sites where you can find these. And if you do have a particular device that you're looking for, or a particular situation that you're hoping to um, bring in technology for, if you, need a, if you need help with that, we do offer services at our center, or I think here in other sites as well, you can have a consultant come out and take a look at the home and make recommendations based on uh, what is needed for that site. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about assistive listening systems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the first one is FM, uh, frequency modulation, kind of like your FM radio, where you have in your car, that would be considered a receiver. You want to receive a radio station, um, and then somewhere out in the mountain somewhere, you have a transmitter that's transmitting the, the, the jockey and the music that is sharing with you over the waves. Uh, you, pick, you tune into that station and you can pick up and hear everything that's being said. The same thing with this device. You have a, a person who is speaking using a transmitter, speaking into a microphone, tuned into a channel, and the person with the receiver can pick up and hear everything. And that type of setup, setup is similar for a person with inf using infrared devices. Uh, this is using visible light waves, similar to what you would see on your remote control for your TV. Uh, if you look at the very top, you can see a little tiny bulb, and inside that bulb we have kind of a transmitting infrared light, invisible to the human eye, and if you wanted to play around the camera, you know, shine it into a video camera, and you can actually see the light on the, on the TV. Um, you also have a device that receives those lights, and then the, the audio can transfer back and forth on that device. <coughs> you also have an audio induction loop. This is the electromagnetic fields. Uh, basically, it's kind of old technology that you would see where electricity is introduced into a wire, and in this case, audio is introduced with has some type of form of electricity. Then you have the device that is like a magnet, that magnetizes and creates the connection between the two devices, and the audio is transferred between those two lines. So, Give you some examples of how the systems work. Here's a picture of, um, <coughs> in this case, FM system works well when there's just one individual talking to maybe one or more individuals in a, in a room setting. In the picture on the left-hand side, you can see the, the teacher, for example, has the transmitter. She's wearing a microphone on her shirt. And then the different class members have a receiver where they can attach either to a headphone or a loop coil where it, it hooks into the hearing aid or you're gonna boot where it connects directly to the hearing aid and they can hear. Then on the right side, you have a speaker that's speaking to a large room setting and the transmitter can be anywhere in that room and it just creates a large circular pattern and it catches everyone within that room. And I think the range is up to about anywhere from 100 to 300 feet, depending on the materials of the room, um, whether how dense the walls are. Uh, I say that because the radio waves can travel through the walls and outside the classroom as well. Infrared settings, usually, mostly used in uh, large settings where you have a stage and a, and a seating area. And on the, uh, you see the stage in the picture and the two rectangles on either side, those would be the transmitters. And the placement of those is very important because they have to be facing the people who are in the seats and whoever's wearing the receivers have to be facing those transmitters. So there has to be a face-to-face -face connection between the two, the two transmitters and receivers for that audio to transport, um, transport back and forth. Hey Mitch, we have a question on that. Mm -hmm. Is the benefit of these transmitters that it reduces the background noise or highlights the sound you want to hear? Say that one more time, I'm sure. sorry. Is the benefit of these transmitters that it reduces the background noise or highlights the sound you want to hear? That is very dependent on the placement of the microphone. Um, if you have a microphone that is on the, the body of the speaker, most likely the, audio, the microphone would just pick up whatever is being spoken by the, the person. If you have a microphone that's kind of a universal microphone or an omnidirectional microphone, that's meaning where the microphone is sitting on a table and it can pick up any sound in the room, 
To give you an example, the speakerphone, microphone on your telephone is an example of that. If you'll notice, uh, if you're using a speakerphone, the person on the other end can hear almost everybody in the room. So if they can hear everybody in the room, it's going to hear all the other sounds as well, uh, the background noise, as you mentioned, the, the fan, the, the static, and so forth. Static is usually a byproduct if the person, the transmitter being near, or even the receiver being near an electronic device, computers, refrigerators, or large machinery, that can also create an interference to static. So, did that help answer the question? Going a little bit more about the next setup, the hearing loop. <clears throat> and you can see in this picture here, and it's probably kind of hard to see, but if you look in the round the, the pews here, you see a wire that looped all the way around, just like the name said, the loop. Uh, so everybody within that loop or the, that circle with the hearing aids uh, that had the telecoil receiver, they, if they switch it to telecoil, they'll be able to pick up everything that's being transmitted through that loop. And though you can see the speaker at the front, number one, is speaking into the microphone. That wire connects into an amplifier. The amplifier trans, uh, pushes that audio through the loop, and then all the hearing aid users would pick up the sound. <clears throat> this technology is probably a little bit older than the others when it comes to the individual devices for hearing devices. Um, and it's probably the easiest to use as well. Uh, almost all hearing aids have telecoil built in. A lot of times, people with hearing aids don't realize that they have a telecoil in their hearing aids, either because they didn't get that information or they've forgotten about it, or it's been turned off. Um, if you wanted to use this device and you don't have the switch for it, ask your audiologist or the person, hearing aid specialist that you went to to <clears throat> to get the hearing aids and ask them, do these, do these hearing aids have telecoil in them? And if it does, ask them to turn it on for you. Um, the, another good example of how it works, if you have a telecoil on your hearing aid, uh, try to use it with your telephone, uh, particularly analog phones. I know digital phones, they have a little bit of trouble with it, but uh, a lot of the digital phones, I say it with a grain of salt because they say that they're hearing aid compatible, but you, you're still competing with the radio transmitter in the, in the phone itself that can create some kind of static over the loop. Um, but if you're using a streamer like myself that connects to the telephone, this is an example of electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic loop. So I put my hearing aid in teleco telecoil mode and then it connects directly and then it sounds nice and clear. I don't have to compete with the radio wave transmitting over my phone next to my ear. Um, there's actually a, uh, a little bit of a movement happening here in, in Utah trying to get large audi um, auditoriums or entertainment venues to have this loop system put in. And the reason why it's so nice is because Opposed to the FM systems or the infrared system, you're having to use additional technology on top of the hearing aid that you have to be able to connect to the audio. However, however with the loop system, if you have that electro, that telecoil turned on, you can just walk into that setting, click on your hearing aids, and then you're connected to the loop, and you can hear everything that's being spoken over the microphone and uh, or being piped through the speakers. Um, the only real disadvantage to this, if you get, find yourself outside of the loop, you'll be disconnected from the loop here. And that kind of applies the same for the radio and infrared systems as well. Hey, Mitch, looks like we have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a speech uh, therapist asking about a, a cultural difference. She says she's heard that some hard of hearing and deaf people do not like receiving speech therapy services because they are proud of their deafness. How might speech therapists consider this when working with hard of hearing or deaf people? That, that last sentence, I'm sorry. How might speech therapists consider this when working with hard of hearing and deaf people? That's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> I myself am a recipient of uh, speech therapy through my lifetime. Um, I've had a hearing loss since birth, <clears throat> and I've had, I call it thousands of hours of speech therapy. And you know, a lot of time when I look back at my childhood, what do I remember the most? Speech therapy. Um, but that's, uh, but I was raised in an oral environment at the time. I didn't know some sign language. 
and um, I mean, it had benefited me in some way. I do, I do have the ability to use hearing aids and hear speech and with speech therapy work and refine my own speech. But I'm just one individual. <clears throat> I'm just one person. A person with a different type of hearing loss, as I mentioned before, with the residual hearing, no matter how much speech therapy you throw at them, they're not, gonna, they're not very likely to be able to correct their speech in a way that's clear and concise as a person who can hear whatever their speech may be. And so when it comes to cultural deaf, deafness, I say it's kind of a tricky situation because I would leave it up to the parents especially. However, I know the individual themselves had the right to all the options available to them. And so I would be sensitive to both the family and the individual as well. Try to talk with them, include them, what your, your plan is, what the goal is, and keep them informed of what that, where, their, where their progress is. Um, if they feel like they're making huge length of progress, and then encourage that. Um, if they feel like they're not, and then most likely they're probably in that range where it's speech is not going to be picked up based on their residual hearing. But of course, this is just my opinion, uh, experience and opinion. Um, I know there's thousands of hours of research on this, so I can't really speak authoritatively on it, uh, but I can share my opinion if that helps. <clears throat> Many uses of listening devices. As I mentioned, all the FM and infrared and electromagnetic devices. Um, Computers, stereo systems, TVs, MP3 players, cell phones, alarm systems, iPads, speakers, announcers, pulpit, the list goes on. All of these can connect to these different listening devices. Um, and it's good to know because, for example, as I mentioned before, my telephone hooks to my streamer. That I can listen to music, I can make phone calls, I can watch movies and hear the audio, I can listen to music and hear the outside noises, or I can hear just the music itself. Um, it's for myself, who loves music, it's, the, it's a great tool. Uh, for others, <clears throat> they may or may not like it. It pretty much depends on the indiv individual preferences. Um, but the options are there if they would like to use it and take advantage of it. I mentioned earlier about microphones. Here's just a short list of the different types of mic microphones. As I mentioned, omnidirectional microphones. This is microphones that pick up every single sound from all angles and directions, even soft to loudness. Unidirectional, a uh, microphone that only work when being spoken directly to the microphone. It may pick up the other sounds as well, but usually focuses on direct connection sounds. Uh, lavalier or lapel phone uh, microphones work the same way. And those are, those are handy because they can be tran um, transferred to one person to another or put on a person, the speaker for example, like I'm wearing a microphone myself, so you can all hear what's being spoken because it's so close to what I'm, where my mouth is. We also have tablecloth or tom um, conference mics. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, these are microphones that use the table as an additional resource to picking up sound in the room. Um, I want to, you know, one of the disadvantages you'd have to be aware of is that rustling of papers on the, on the table or tapping of nails or writing, that can also be picked up over the microphone as well. So. But number one, most important, the placement of the microphone will determine how successful the equipment works for the person who's using it. <clears throat> A couple of examples of coupling devices, um, it can be for a person with, without a hearing aid or without T-coils, they can use headphones, their earbuds, and there, there's a thousand of them out there. I, it's just impossible for me to list them on here. Just go to Amazon, for example, or any other website, eBay, Google Shopping, and so forth. Type in, in those keywords, you'll see a thousand of them. They're all right there. And of course, each of them have their own brand and quality. <clears throat> and so based on the person's hearing loss, they may help them or may not. Person with a hearing aid that has the telecoil, neck loop or a silhouette. This is basically a device that works right next to the hearing aid. And it works the same technology as electromagnetic loop. Um, it, the, the, the hearing aid is switched on telecoil and the silhouette creates that connection between the hearing aid and the audio. 
And you also have other devices like the FM boot. You have the picture of the person with the hearing aid with the large boot on the bottom. That itself is the receiver and can pick up the FM, the waves, and so forth. Then we have a Bluetooth bridge. Um, what I'm wearing right here on my neck, we're in the picture here. Um, that, and different hearing aid companies have it programmed to work with their hearing aids. And then, so if a person has a Bluetooth, connect, Bluetooth connection to a, an iPad or a telephone, they can pick up that audio, turn it on with the streamer, and then connect it to the hearing aid with uh, relative ease. So. <coughs> Here's a few pictures of alerting devices that are available. Um, of course, you can see you have devices that work with doorbells, telephones, alarm clocks, baby cry, and of course you have devices that also control your light on and off, but also flash whether it's the baby or so forth. Um, I am a father of five children, and as I mentioned before, my wife is profoundly deaf. All of this equipment that you see here were very important in our household, that especially the baby cry. Um, if the baby's crying at nighttime, our bed would shake. They have the vibration, we know the baby's hungry, feed her, or him, we have both, um, and then put it back down to sleep. And people have asked me, have you ever turned it off? No, I have never turned it off. Here's a few examples of different types of alarm clocks. Uh, and you can see there's many different types. We have one that works in a home setting where you have the large clock and then a large vibrator that goes underneath the mattress or in a pillow, but usually the mattress. We also have devices that are called travel alarms. Um, it's just a small round or a square device that you can put inside your pillow while you travel. Uh, you don't have to um, throw that vibrator underneath the mattress to every hotel or place you go to. <clears throat> and you also have the alarm clock that have, like the, like the telephone ringers as I mentioned, they have very loud ringers with high frequency or low frequency ringers as well. And then you have an alarm clock with a light flashing on top of it. Um, and, you know, and depending on the severity of how deep a person sleeps, the light may or may not be helpful. Um, myself, for example, lights don't help, so I have to go with the vibration because I'm a pretty heavy sleeper. But for other individuals, the light may be helpful for them. <clears throat> you also see a clock or a watch there where a person wears it on their wrist. That watch can vibrate on their wrist. They also have watches now that are coming out that can connect with the doorbells, baby cry, and um, um, top phone ringers as well. And that's very nice too. Here's a few examples of doorbells or knock signalers. Um, you have a doorbell, or you can, it creates its own wire, or you can have a doorbell that works with an existing doorbell in a home. Uh, they just connect the uh, transmitter to the, the doorbell bell itself, and every time you ring a bell, there's an electrical impulse, so that impulse would trigger the transmitter, and the transmitter would send to whatever receiver is, is around about the house, and the light would either flash, or the bed would shake, and so forth. <clears throat> and you'll see on the bottom left-hand side, that black square, um, that's also a, a transmitter where a person would step on it. It would send a transmission, the, the light would flash, or a vibration and so forth. Or on the right-hand side, where a connection is broken, um, that would create the flash too. Uh, that can be used as a security method as well. These are very helpful for families with young children, especially children that like to take off out the front door. Um, a lot of time parents who are deaf would have that on their front door, so if the child opened the door, the light would flash or a vibration would go off, and they can follow out, out the door to, to catch the, the wayward toddler. Uh, the alligator is not a doorbell or knock signaler, um, but it is a good picture of a person who would uh, tr activate those devices. We have telephone and video phone signalers. <clears throat> and again, we have a device that works with all, all four devices, baby, door, um, alarm, and telephone. And so when a, when a phone rings, that, that bed could vibrate or the light could flash. You can also have a strobe light there. And then you can see in the kind of the middle, the bottom middle, is that little black box there. That's actually a body-worn uh, receiver. They would vibrate and the person can look down and depending on what light is flashing, they can tell whether it's the phone doorbell or a baby cry and so forth. Then on the top right-hand side, I added that in there because it kind of shows the 
creative juices that are flowing out there with people with different alert devices. So like the phone that when it rings, that little windmill, the uh, merry-go-round would go around. The person would know that there's a, a signal just came through. So. <clears throat> Here's a few pictures of super loud ringers. As you can see, they have nice big speakers on them. And they also have the volume and tone controls and as well as a pattern too, so they can change the different types of patterns that are being used when it comes to the ring. And let me tell you, they are very loud. They, they actually hurt my ears as well. Baby cry monitors. Um, I have a child that's 13 years old and the youngest is six months. And just in that short period of time, I've seen a drastic in change in the types of baby cry monitor that are out there. Whether you, they're using the simple listen and transmit type of device, or video cameras, or uh, in other types of devices out there, there, there's so many of them out there that just work fantastic, and they're all available to anyone who has, individuals who have hearing loss and have babies or young children. So, emergency alert systems. <clears throat> As you can see, all of them use strobe lights. Um, just because the strobe is bright and drastic, so you want you want the emergency to be well known. You don't want a nice soft light flashing and when there's a smoke or a fire happening. Uh, and they and uh, thanks to the the ADA, a lot of public ben, uh, public sites now have these strobe lights installed in their home, so it's not just audio; it's, it's light flashing as well. And then there's a few more other alert, alert receivers. I mentioned the personal pager before, and there's a few others there where they have the light control in the top right-hand corner. Uh, the, they would create the light flash, but as well the person be able to control the lights as well also. Um, and this, these are usually what are good for people who travel. Um, you'll find them in motel ADA kits, as you call them. Um, if a person with a hearing loss wants to be able to use these devices, you can just ask the front desk at the hotel and say, I would like the, uh, the ADA hearing loss kit or death kit. Or sometimes they actually have a room that's already been outfitted with all the equipment, so they can just put the log you into that room um, and use those as well. And then the, the, uh, the bottom right hand side is just a very l bright light. A lot of people ask me if that's a fish tank. It's not, it's just a very bright strobe light. Uh, that's usually helpful in like warehouse or work, work site settings um, where you need the very bright light, the flash, so many people can see it in different directions. And then there's home automation. Um, this is technology that's it's been around for a while, but it's become a lot more popular and more well used in the last, I'd say, 10 or 15 years. Uh, basically, you're, you're using computers to automate your home. Um, you've seen them on TV uh, where you can, the person uh, had to break in at home and they look at their iPhone and they can see the video camera on their phone and see the person in the house and they can turn the lights on or off or, and so forth just from the touch of their smartphone. The same type of setting can, same, same type of equipment can be reprogrammed or programmed to help person with a hearing loss. For example, if somebody rings the doorbell or a phone rings or any type of event happening in the house, they can send out through the program having certain lights in the house flash based on the audio. Um, and it's a very nice system. I mean, if you wanted to be so um, creative, you can actually have your sprinklers go off when the baby cries or, and so forth. This is how, how helpful this home automation is. It's very useful. It's also very expensive, but the prices have come, come down in the, la the last few years, so the options are all available if people want to have very cool equipment to work with the different uh, need for hearing in the house. Hearing dogs or animals, I call them assistive technology because they, they're also well trained and very helpful to alert the master when the phone rings or the, somebody's at the door or the baby's crying or even out in public to alert, uh, alert them of important, important noises, noises that they need to know. Um, <coughs> they, these are specifically trained dogs for this type of assignment. Uh, and 
I know thumb dog naturally help with the, they're mastered with the different types of sounds that happened in the homes. Um, but if you wanted to have them be labeled as a service dog, it would be ideal to have them go through the training. I know there's a good location in Oregon that provides this training for the, the dogs, for people who are with hearing loss. And talk a little bit about relay services. <clears throat> a TTY relay, I put that on there first, but it's also one that's very rarely used. If I were to give this presentation about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I would say it's very heavily used. Um, but nowadays, go to the next one, video relay service, had pretty much dominated the, the use of relay here in the United States, particularly for people who use American Sign Language. Um, and it's the same concept where you have the person, the sign language user, they call in, they connect on the video phone with an interpreter, the interpreter calls the person who hears or speaks. Um, so whatever I'm signing, the interpreter would voice for me, and then whatever the person is saying, the interpreter would sign. And so communication would happen back and forth. The same idea with the text-to-speech. In, in this case, they're typing everything instead of signing. And, uh, and this is the, a, very, a great advancement, but especially for American Sign Language users, because a TTY conversation that took about a half an hour can be done in five minutes or less on a video relay service. And the person can use their natural language, which is American Sign Language, rather than trying to go through English, which is usually their second language. So. Caption telephones, as I mentioned earlier, the, where they can see everything that's being said. And there's also internet relay, and examples of that is voice carryover. Um, this is usually helpful with person who may or may not have clear and concise, spe concise speech, and so they could have somebody who can reverberate everything that's being said, or they can have a relay where they can still see everything, but also hear what everything that's being said as well. And then there's also video remote interpreting where there's not using telephone, but if there's a location site where you have a monitor and a video camera and a microphone, and so two individuals in a room, one who's the American Sign Language user and the other one who was speaking, and the interpreter on the monitor hears everything and then interprets. Um, this is being used more and more nowadays. However, there's a word of warning that the, this is very heavily rely, reliant on technology. So if the technology is not very reliable, it can be frustrating when trying to use. But it is available and it's very helpful. Here's your, uh, your kind of an audio or a graphical information about video relay service. As you can see in the middle of the interpreter, on the left-hand side is the sign language user, and on the right-hand side is the English-speaking user. And so the interpreter in the middle is going back and forth, relaying the communication back and forth to the two callers. The caption telephone, and you can see on the bottom left-hand side, that's what an example of a caption telephone looks like, and you can see the, the text on the screen. And on the right-hand side, this is how it's being used. Number one and two, um, they can hear each other. They're speaking back and forth. And number three is the relay operator. The technology is, is uh, voice recognition technology. However, as we know, voice, recogni voice recognition is not a perfect science. So the operator is there to make uh, corrections where needed um, to help make the communication more clear between the two individuals. The relay operator in this case is not seen or heard. Um, only the two individuals can see each other. And now we have smartphones. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, smartphones in the last 10 or 15 years have just revolutionized the way the um, people with hearing loss can communicate or be involved, um, basically because there's so many more tools that are available to them. Not only do we have email and text messaging available to them, but we also have um, different devices. If I can switch to my iPad here. I can show you in a few examples of those. I think I might have to switch here. There we go. Change the airplay to the 
it TriCaster? Okay, blue. And it keeps going away. I'll try one more time. If that didn't work, and then I'll just go on the. I have a little technical difficulty here. Get it. Now, there's certain, there are a few apps that are available out there for use. <coughs> Google Hangout is a very common one. There's also Skype, there's Tango, uh, there is, I'll see if I can bring it up on my computer so I can read it here. We also have Facebook Messenger, which is now including video, uh, conferencing between two individuals, as well as texting back and forth. And we also have Uvu is another example. Uh, the list goes on. If you were to go into a, the, the app store and do uh, video, video app to video call apps and do a search, you would find a lot of different apps available for individuals who use. So, so these are very, very helpful tools that are available to people with smartphones. And uh, as I mentioned before, the streamers can work with the telephone so they can person not only can hear it being said, but there are different cell phone companies like Verizon are now including video in their own, in their own way where they can now allow video along with audio uh, when making a phone call with someone with certain types of smartphones. So a person with a hearing loss, this is very helpful because not only they can see the caller and they can hear them as well and go back and forth. So. I think we may have gotten it up again. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, there we go. <coughs> as you can see, these are a few examples of the apps that are available. Um, and I mentioned before a video relay service. I just want to show you a little bit how it works. We open it up, and basically this is just uh, this is one company. There's many different ones that they're available. Uh, there's also Purple, Combo, ZBRS, Sorenson, SBRS, and so forth. Um, based on what your personal preference is, you can try any of these. So you just type in the phone number. <coughs> I would just. Uh, I would just call in, I'll call my cell phone for example, I keep going through a setup here, excuse me, okay, I'm going to call my cell phone, and so I'll make the phone call, the interpreter would come up on the screen and you can see the interpreter here, I'm just say hello. So I just told the interpreter that I would do an in demonstration and she would very gracious to let me uh, do that and connect and show you how I would communicate between two people, uh, or a person who can hear, I can use sign language to communicate and they can call me back. So, so yes, another great tool. Uh, I'm gonna show you really quickly uh, the video option, Facebook Messenger, if you have that. If you look in the top right hand side, you can see the video camera. And so now I'm going into a call. Um, I won't, I won't answer and embarrass him because I know he's being broadcast. We'll hang up on him. Uh, another one, Google Hangout, if you're familiar with that. You can see the video camera on the very, underneath my name in the middle there, press video. And then you can go to a video call. You can, you can see my hand over the camera here. And then, the Glide, which is the text, video text messaging app. Um, so basically you can see 
previous messages that people have left, and including myself, and then I can just, I press the record button, hello, I'm doing a demonstration, then I press send, and the message is sent immediately. Um, this is fantastic for people who don't want to use texting, but they want to use American Sign Language instead. They can just find that message and they'll send it right off. Tango is another one that's available for use. Um, it's even an app I didn't sign into that one because I don't use that one much anymore. But uh, if you wanted to use something different, that's a very good one. And then of course there's Skype. And many of people are familiar with Skype. Not only does it have audio, it does have um, video as well. So you set up an account and you can connect directly. So <clears throat> give you an example of uh, the great apps that are out there. I mean, myself, I love these devices to no end because they give me so many options when it comes to creating, to communicating with my friends or even family who may not know sign language. And now to uh, get toward the end of the presentation here, I just want to kind of wrap it up to a few key points. Um, basically, just recognize deaf culture. Um, just many customers who are deaf may feel uncomfortable outside of their culture, just like people who may not know sign language may not feel comfortable talking to somebody who is deaf just because there's always that barrier of communication between two individuals. And a lot of time that happened because there's a fear of making a mistake and trying to understand what is being said to one another. And sometimes that fear can be misinterpreted as, uh, you know, impolite or rudeness and so forth. So a lot of times, just try to smile, work through it, and create, do the best you can to establish communication between two people. And I'd say play word, lots of word definition games, because if a person is a lip reader, maybe they didn't catch one word, maybe you can try a different word that means the same thing, because some words are easier to understand than others when lip reading. Very briefly, I just want to show you a little bit about the services at DSDHH. This is where I'm a part of. As you can see, um, the second one, Outreach and System Technology Program, that's my program. We also have the Deaf Program, which create education, education and activities for people who are deaf. We have the Heart of Hearing, which creates coping and supportive skills for people who are late deafened or have hard of hearing, have visual hearing. Adult education classes, uh, just like a community center, provide uh, classes for individuals who want to further their skills or education. Utah Interpreter Program, they are part of the training and certification for all the state, all of the interpreters in the state of Utah. And we have, uh, we also have a beautiful building in Taylorsville, Utah, where uh, people who are deaf and have their own organization can and come and participate, as well as the hard of hearing to have meetings and classes and so forth. And communication is no barrier, no matter whatever the need may be, whether it's interpreters or using assistive devices or captioning or loop systems and so forth. We also have mental health and case management services, and then as well as employment placement services as well. All of these are available for people with hearing loss and, and looking for a barrier-free um, services within the, within the state that they can be a part of. So if you ever have any further questions, feel free to ask me. Uh, you can contact me <clears throat> by phone or email, or uh, you can write a letter if you want to at this address. This is our uh, office there, and I appreciate all of your time and questions that you may have. Looks like we'll take one more question, Mitch. Mm -hmm. A couple of people are interested in knowing which type of assistive devices you find most helpful. The one I find most helpful. Doorbells are very helpful. Um, doorbell devices. <clears throat> I, we don't, we have a telephone in our home, even though neither my wife or myself use it. Um, my kids are the ones that pretty much use it because they can all hear. So we don't really use a phone signal system there. However, I do have the phone has an automatic transfer forward to my cell phone. So that's kind of a creative use of using technology to, to understand when someone is calling me. Can my cell phone ring and my cell phone always on my, on my body. Um, the baby cry is very helpful in my home and the alarm clock, the, the vibration alarm clock, uh, just because I can't hear the noise in the morning and the lights don't help me. 
then of course all the smartphone apps, I, the list goes on with that, so. Okay, well we, we wanna thank Mitch. We sure appreciate him sharing his expertise with us today. Um, I'd encourage you to take the evaluation. Uh, that helps us uh, know where you're coming from and what you're looking for in the future. That link is on the bottom of the AggieCast page titled UATP Survey. And we are working on a training for the fall and it will be about uh, low-tech uh, augmentative and assistive uh, communication devices. And if you have other ideas, we'd love to hear those. And I'd like to note that this training will be archived online after it's closed captioned and we'll also have a few DVDs available. And you can find the rest of our webinars archived online uh, on our blog in that address is utahatprogram.blogspot.com. And that's under the archive trainings tab. I will also send an email out when the link to this video is available online. And we appreciate your participation. And if you have questions about the services from UATP, you can visit our website, uh, which is uatpat.org.